said it would be good to recap what we did last time. So last time we started to hand bill. I have some of your own prototypes made here. The labor. Congratulations to those who managed to complete the task. Uh, we made some prototypes. These prototypes are what we describe as linkage or linkage exchange. And we noticed that this prototype has a very interesting property. They are rigid in the box. But on the other hand, at the very edge, they exhibit what we can call edge soft mode. And we track the origin of this soft mode that we have at the edge to the fact that we, this, we can imagine the system as originally living on a ring and capping it in such a way that you create two bars. We also stated that this, that this system, if you consider only the vibrational insulator because its modes are localized at the edge and hence we concluded that not they do not propagate. So this is an insulator of topological origin and indeed it mimics many uh, features of some of the quantum counterparts with the only difference that the vibrational or the motion is really repeated. In the other case are mapping the electronic repeat. But we noticed But we noticed that there is a very important physical distinction between mechanics and quantum mechanics. The electronic states live in the Hilbert space, which is a space separated from the space in which the structure lives. Okay. Whereas vibrations or motions involve motion of atoms or nuts and bolts in real space. And so what we observed uh, is that when we take one of these modes and we excite it, that is to say, we try to push it. We cause a deformation in the structure, and the deformation in the structure allows the mode to propagate. And now the softness moves a step at a time. Here now it's rigid, but in the place where you shifted that softness, uh, well, it's soft again. It's as if the mode gets carried at what we called a domain wall, separating, well, now I'm going to be messed around, but right-leaning from left-leaning states defined by whether this rod is pointing like this or across this side is pointing like that. Okay? And of course, we observe that uh, if you literally tilt this chain, that's enough to set the motion free. Okay? And another thing that we did is that, especially this was evident in the practical, we notice here that um, this uh, chain uh, the degree of softness here involves just a couple of, uh, of uh, points. But when you make it with slightly different parameters, this is one example done by one of the students, you can see the localization at the edge changes a little bit. Okay? And um, however, the existence of, the, of this propagating state is robust. There is actually an example in polyacetylene, uh, which can conduct by means of solitons, but of course it will not be zero energy, because um, typically electrons are not, are, you know, don't have the same uh, properties I described here. Of no, this is a very specific feature. And this no, I, I think this is what engineer called a mechanism. So there could be a mechanism also involving two or three dimensions. We just singled out this for simplicity. Um, one thing that also is quite interesting is that some of the other students also made the prototypes like this. And they observed that you can even mess around a little bit with the length of the chain, not, not make it uniform everywhere, and still the motion survive. Okay? So there's certain robustness also to what people call disorder, provided you don't exceed some pressure. And so I think that the time is ripe to literally go black back to the drawing board and try to understand the, the mathematics behind what we've done, okay? In other words, try to write down equations that tells us, okay, how much 
how, how localized is this degree of softness, whereas it's here or somewhere else in the sample, okay? And in general, what is the shape of the deformation? So as you notice from uh, a Mark's talk, uh, um, topology is particularly good at making qualitative statements and uh, of very broad generality. But usually the power of topology is fully uncovered when you couple it with field theory. In other words, we're writing down equations uh, that will describe, in this case, the elastic deformation. And so the purpose of today is to start from Pythagoras' theorem, uh, uh, um, helped with this uh, infamous trigonometric identities, and uh, derive precisely the uh, solid solutions that you see propagating in this chart. It's clearly a case study, and I think it will bring in some nice points that Mark also touched, in particular in connection with the domain wall. And you know, if you have a lot of stamina, you can actually do this construction also for more complex defect structures. Okay, well let's get started. So I suggest that we, we take a good look at this, at this system, and we make a bit of a new drawing. In particular, noted that in the, in the ground state, all these angles or reports are the same. Okay, in other words, okay, this angle is theta bar, let's say, this is minus, this is theta bar, theta bar, it's a uniform state, okay? But what we want to now calculate uh, is the non-uniform state, as Mark said, okay? So how do we do it? Well, let's make a better plot. So let's say this is the bar, so these are the points where we have pinned each rotor. Um, in yellow, I'm gonna draw the rotor itself. At a distance A along these lines, there will be another point where we're gonna have another rotor. So imagine I've drawn this guy. Imagine that I've, I've uh, um, where is it? Yes, um, I've drawn this, and then we are connecting it to another, or, or this one and this, and there will be something that connects the two, like this, this, this thing here. So let me just draw it. It's probably easier to see it here. So there are two angles. I'm gonna call this angle theta n. I'm gonna call this angle theta n plus one. Then you can imagine that on top of the rotor memory there is a, some sort of particle here. And then uh, there will be something that joins them, okay? Uh, which is straight, okay? And now, we will assign length r to these rotors. These are absolutely um, rigid. They're, um, uh, and we will assign a length l n n plus one to this one here. Now this one here could in principle be, if you like, a spring. could be a spring, so it could be stretchable. This is my spring, can you see it? Okay, and so um, concentrating on the zero energy motion, the one that involves not zero kinetic energy, kinetic energy is always there, zero potential energy motion, stretching energy motion, means writing down a constraint that this quantity, L, or if you like, delta L N N plus one will always be equal to zero. In other words, the springs will never be stretched, okay? And if it wasn't, if, the, if this quantity was not equal to zero, then you would have a cost proportional to the, to the square. Okay. So I can simply write down my, sorry, this uh, uh, shorts are not, the best. Huh? I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, we'll, 
will overcome this difficulty. Um, this is the constraint equation. L bar is the rest length. Okay. Now, so all we have to do here is to express um, this distance in terms of the parameter in this model. Okay. And this will indeed not involve much more than simple trigonometry. Uh, and of course, I'm going to ask you guys to give in. So, uh, using a very famous result of geometry, uh, Pythagoras' theorem, we can estimate um, the height. We well, not estimate; we can calculate actually for once um, this quantity. So, I was I would propose that the way we arrange this is to split this triangle in this part and this part. So, first calculate this, and then sum it with that, and then square. So, th this this whole lecture is going to be very detailed, very pedantic, every factor of two. Okay. There is another approach, which is to resort to symmetries and write down the answer immediately. Why don't we do that? Is because in my opinion, it doesn't harm at least once in your life to see it done in a really pedantic way. And it's also true that sometimes you discover new things, but first study a particular case and then understanding the, what you actually done, okay? Can you hear? Yeah, no, it, and that's the other thing. If you can interrupt with bestiality of this type of theory, it would be great. Yeah. Okay, so what is this? Anybody? This length. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Sign? If you have, I want this. Cosine. Cosine, okay. So uh, can, you, can you see if I write here? Yeah, so I'm gonna say, please shout. Say, say, say loud. Okay. You mean this? Okay. So it's this piece plus this piece. Can you see that this is the angle theta n plus one, and this is the, the angle theta n? Clear to everybody? Okay, and uh, what, what do I do with this? No, 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 wait, wait, but for Pythagoras, what do I do with this? Square, Good. square, okay. Then what else do I need to do? I need to calculate this. What's that? So I, I say from here, so this guy is this that we want, right? So I say, let's go from here to here. That's A, okay? Then let's add this guy. What's this guy? R sine theta n plus one. But then let's subtract this other guy. All right, so plus A plus R sine theta N plus one minus R sine theta N, all squared. And this is equal to, well, it better be equal to this quantity, which is the uniform state, okay? And the uniform state is when theta n is equal to, theta, theta n is equal to theta n plus one. Uh, let me write it down. So at, at equilibrium, uh, theta n plus one equal theta n equal theta bar, okay? And so I just read it off from here. Right, if this are two, these two are equal, this is just gonna be two r cos theta bar, so square it is equal to four r square cos square theta bar, plus this and this cancel, a square, and we're done. Okay, so, I mean, this is really not rocket science. 
but then the question is, where do you want to go? So, you know, it's almost impossible to start the calculation without having a guess of what the answer should be. That guess usually comes either from general results or from physical intuition or just the fact that you don't know what to do. Okay. And so you, the first thing you have to know is you, what, you need to know what you want. And this is generally true, though hard. But so here, what do we want? What do we want? Other than getting to the beach as quick as possible. I would settle even for differential equation because that's pretty much the only thing I know how to solve, the simple ones, which is more or less the same thing. It's just you've got to go, the recursion relation will probably be some sort of discrete relationship. So we, so we want a differential equation because, you know, why do I say that? Because, you know, you know how ways propagate in a solid, just a linear elastic way. There's an equation you just learn as you know how to solve. We want the equivalent of that in the system. That's it. Okay, so the problem with this is that I don't see any derivatives. Okay, and so we got to massage it until the derivative popped up. Okay, so now that you know the answer, you know how you massage it. Okay, well, you know what you want, right? Good. All right, and so how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, you have to do a little bit of math. You have to be patient. Uh, that, for example, is not my strength. But uh, in this case, it only involves expanding this expression, okay? Now, let's do it slowly. The potential for mistake is extremely high. So I squared this, and I pick up a cos theta n plus one squared. But I see is body over here, okay? So once I raise everything, I'm gonna get certainly r squared. But I'm gonna do it for this guy and his body too. So I'm gonna pick up another R squared, okay? And then, well, I'm gonna pick up the, the cross product of these two. That's gonna be two R squared cos theta n plus one cos theta n. And then, well, I'm gonna pick up cross term from here too, most crucially the one in this and that, which is gonna look like minus two r squared sine theta n plus one sine theta n, all right? And well, there's, got, there's also other stuff. There's this with this, there is this with this. So let's get them right, plus two a r sine theta n plus one minus two r a sine theta n, okay? And there's something that I forgot, I believe. A squared, okay? Plus a squared, it, it doesn't harm to, to count the, the dumb number of terms is what it's supposed to be, equal to a squared, that starts looking good because I can do this, plus this over here, <coughs> plus four R squared cos squared theta bar, okay? And there's a lot of uh, things that are floating around here that we could uh, eliminate. Starting with factors of two. Okay, so I'm gonna, let's kill this. <coughs> I want to short the right. Let, this is gone. I also want to eliminate R squared. Okay, so I'm, I'm dividing everything by that. So I'm authorized to throw this. I can throw this. I can throw this, I can throw this, provided that I put an R under here. Throw, throw, divide. These are gone anyway. Throw this and stick it to there. All right. Problems? Well, then you look at some of these things and they just s smell like high school, solid high school mathematics. 
cos theta n plus 1, cos theta n, minus sine theta n plus 1, sine theta n. Unless I made a mistake, the answer is in the trigonometric cheat sheet. It's the sum, cos of the sum, right? Cos of the sum. So I, why don't we, uh, uh, I believe this is becoming uh, redundant. Okay, uh, you, you can see if I write here? Ah, because essentially um, you could interpret what this is, is the configuration you start with, which is uniform, in which each rotor has theta bar, and the next one is down by, sorry, each rotor has theta bar, minus th theta bar here, theta bar, theta bar, the uniform state. That's the length in the uniform state. In the non-uniform state, the thetas are not identical at, at each point. Okay? And so I just concentrated on a unit cell. And I don't know the uniform state, but it doesn't matter as long as you are using the block to identify the theta and the theta and the theta and the theta. Oh, well, no, but, well, but, you know, yeah. What you can do is you can also write down an energy and see whether there. But uh, in in this case, is indeed by inspection. I mean, also symmetries are by inspection. You just have to look at the thing and see what the symmetries you have. It's not that they come from God. I mean, if it's in a structure that you make, if you make it differently, we have a different symmetry. Yeah, sometimes they're not exactly in the same place. Yeah, here they are because we made it. I mean, there's probably more intelligent answers. I just tell you the stupid ones because they're, they're sufficient for what I'm doing. Okay. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to march through all this stuff, okay? So I'm going to write down here cos theta n plus 1 plus theta n. Okay. Now, what's, what's, what's off? There's another one here that smells funny. It's one plus this guy over here, which is actually a minus. One minus this guy. If you look at the cheat sheet, you will find <coughs> one minus this is cos two of that. It's minus cos. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna write down here minus cos. Oh what? this. Okay. Yeah. Well, and then I think I'm pretty much stuck with whatever is left, which is these two guys. Okay. So I, I just have to write plus A over R sine theta N plus 1 minus sine theta n and the only thing I can add is equal to zero <coughs> and I would like to box this equation not because it's particularly profound but because it's less messy okay now we look at that and we say Hmm, this, this, remember what we want to do. What we want to do is we want to get differential equations, all right? So the preliminary step to take a differential equation from a discrete model is to take a difference, okay? And uh, what's the term there that looks more awful? The last one. And in particular, another thing that you notice, again, by inspection, it's not even true for all the solutions that this guy can have, is that even in the non-uniform solution, usually theta n and theta n plus 1 don't differ by much. 
It doesn't have to be. But you just look at it and you say, well, it doesn't just, it's a reasonable assumption. And you could make, even make it as a working assumption. So you can then say, um, well, just armed with this basic fact, uh, why don't we make a first attempt to take the continuum limit? Okay. How many of you are not familiar with the expression taking the continuum limit? You're all familiar. It means that you go from a model which is discrete to one expressed in terms of fields. So theta n, now it's a, it's a variable, now will become a field, like the magnetization or the electric field or so on and so forth. Okay, so it's always a very tricky step. So take continuum limit. Take continuum. In some cases, it's not even possible. A lot of the interesting research in modern uh, solid state physics is about cases in which you cannot take the continuum limit easily. But here we can. So how are we going to do this? Well, so huh? yes, so we, we, we're going to assume that, uh, although it's not really true in, in practice, that um, the variable in which we measure our display, you know, the dx is going to be this a. So please notice, you can take the continuum limit even if the A is not microscopic, provided that the solution you study, you don't require information about distances compared to A, okay? So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna say A is gonna go into dx, okay? Huh? Well, if, you, if you're noticing here, again, this is the importance of observation. Um, the, um, yeah, the penetration uh, goes all the way from one to possibly as large as the sample, depending on, I don't know if you remember, there was one slide in which I even wrote the answer, although I didn't derive them, I'm gonna do it now. It depends on theta bar. When theta bar goes to zero, actually the, the penetration depth, or if you like, the length over this thing is soft, diverges. Certainly in that limit, that length will be larger than A. And then what you can try, you can look on a computer. How does the solution I find analytically works as I go outside of the domain in which it was originally designed? The answer typically is still okay and even in this case. And I, if I have time, I'll show it to you. Now, what I would like to also say here is we have to now change the variable. We have to say theta n goes into theta of x, all right? Second thing we have to do is we, which is very convenient, is, is to say, well, if theta n and theta n plus one are very, very close to each other, well, if I take the average of them, it's probably going to be theta x2, okay? Now, this, of course, is, is somewhat putting some constraints on the type of solution you can, you can have. But we'll take it as a working assumption. So you can do m more cumbersome algebra and not make this, this um, assumption, uh, this, uh, this requirement. And then you, I'll show you later what you get. You see what I'm saying? The average of nearby uh, angles is just the angle. There it is. Okay. Well, now we look at this. We look at this, and we simplify it. Please. Um, so, usually, what we do is we look to a specific uh, model. No, I don't like to view it like that. So, you see, when you do a continuum limit, you know the the a could be even a kilometer. If I do a continuum theory and I make prediction on something on the distance on, on 100 kilometer scale, then I'm fine. In other words, provided that you do prediction on scales that are much larger than the discrete structure that you're considering to be infinitesimal, your prediction would be correct. Of course, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. But mathematically, yeah, mathematically, I'm I'm, I'm taking A to be infinitesimal. That's what, what, what this notation means. 
but it doesn't mean that the structure has to be made of atoms in order for that to be correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but as I said, it's not just the system size only, it's uh, the length scale at which you want to make prediction about. No, even in my toy model, uh, the, 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 so, okay, so in, in this toy model, <laughs> indeed, things are very localized, okay? But that's just, but I can make them as wide as I like, okay? In other words, this domain wall doesn't have to stretch over only two lattice spacings. It can be the whole system size. And it's controlled by this parameter in a way that we can calculate. And we already guessed a little bit by playing with it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would just say that I'm taking the continuum here. I mean, uh, what, what does the continuum limit mean? means that I'm, uh, I'm replacing a discrete system with a field. Good. Okay. Um, because also the row has some structure that is, <laughs> that is neglected when you look only at the, uh, the, the larger thing. Okay, good. Let's uh, move on. So what, do, what can we do here then? Well, this first term, uh, we can write it as cos 2 theta, okay, this is remaining what it is, cos 2 theta bar, and now we have to play with this, this term, okay, now this other, this guy here, it's also somewhat familiar, hmm? problems, no, if there are questions, please uh, interrupt, how do we deal with this? Again, what, what would we want in an ideal world to make a derivative? Yeah, exactly. So in other words, we would like to have theta n plus one minus theta n stuck inside only one of these guys, not split between two. Okay. And now the question is that, can all the tricks help with that? Okay. Which one? The bottom. Let's do that, let's try it. So we've got to rewrite this plus A over R. It's gonna be, this is two. Let's try to keep track of this two. Uh, they're always the mess here. Cos theta n, well okay, here this is gonna give you theta n plus one plus theta n divided by two, which for us is just cos t, all right? So it's really this, this one here where the, the beef is at sine theta n plus one minus theta n divided by two. And of course, this is still equal to zero. Okay, good. And what can we do now? And of course, it's in making, um, yeah, that's exactly what we're gonna do. Now, you look at this and you say, as it was just suggested, do this, sine x proportional to x, Taylor series, okay, to leading order. Um, but notice you're telling series the difference, not this. Because the field can be whatever they want. It's the difference that gives you the, the potential source of strength. Okay? Good. Now, what we're going to do with this then? Well, it's going to become, let me focus on it here. It's going to become theta n plus 1 minus theta n. Okay, the factor of 2, I don't think it's very uh, useful. Just put it here. And now, if I want to make this into a derivative, 
what shall I do? In a poor man's fashion. What's a derivative? What's a, or what's a gradient, I should say? <coughs> it's, it's something divided by length. But I don't see any length there. So what do I do if I really want what I want? I put it. But you see, if you really want what you want and you just do it, that's cheating. What do you have to do if you want to be honest and still persistent? Put it somewhere else in a way that it can Yeah, for example. Okay. So now we have what we want. What is this in the limit that we were discussing? Yeah. Derivative of theta with respect to dx. There is this factor going with the polarized, which of course will nicely couple with this other stuff over here. Okay? There's also a potential of killing a factor of two, which is always very appealing. And um, and I'm gonna just write down the final answer. Okay. You watch out that I don't squeeze at the very last a fatal mistake. Cos two theta minus cos two theta bar plus a squared. This is cancelled with that. Over r d theta dx cos theta equal Zero. Let's box it. Yes. Well, it's leading order in the derivative dependence. Uh, if your question is, uh, had I been more persevering and gone to higher order, would I picked up other order terms? Yes, but, but to leading order, these are these are the terms. So what what will come out uh, in a moment as more uh, clear is that the dimensionless parameter it's a over r. It's not quite as obvious yet here, but it will be in a moment. But the first thing I would like to uh, tell you is, notice one thing which is kind of interesting here. This equation, it's first order. That's kind of interesting. Right? Because, okay, there's no time yet, but okay, time we can always put it. But it's, there's only one derivative. Other stuff has two derivatives typically. Because one derivative is the force. Yeah, so typically you have two derivatives. It's an interesting point. Okay, but it's not something to worry about. If anything, you can be happy about it. Um, now, the other thing is uh, th it's all in terms of costs. There's nothing wrong with costs, I suppose. But the, the thing is, um, we said that the, the, the interesting quantity that really distinguished the domain wall was the projection on the x-axis, right? Do you remember we said domain wall? Actually, we do it. Every time we forget, we can do it in this wall. This guy is going like this. This guy is going like that. The domain wall is defined by this easing-like variable, left-right leaning versus left leaning versus right leaning. And that's not cos, but something else. You know, trigonometry is one of those businesses which is either head or tail. Sun. I mean, there's also the other one, but they're, they're derived. Okay. Good. So, sign. So, how do we convert this into signs? 
I just don't want to see costs anymore. I just want to see signs. Yeah, or, you know, when, you know, since the cheat sheet is here, we may as well cheat all the way. So look at this one here. One minus cos, all right? So if I take a one out of here, I sneak it in, boom, and I subtract. We all have to be honest. Then you have one minus this, and then you have minus one minus that, all right? And that will give you two sine squared or whatever that whatever you want, okay? So let's do that. So that one is gonna give you uh, two, let me re-go back in white, two, uh, please help me. Uh, oh yeah, I just have to, uh, here there's a potential for a mistake in the sign, but I believe I'll make it. Sine squared theta bar minus sine squared theta, all right, yes, plus a squared r, oh, how am I going to deal with the other final cost? There are two choices. One is leakiest than the other. That's the third act, I didn't think about that. Whoever gives me the right answer, I'll buy him uh, a tisane. <laughs> no more Capirinha, doctor, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is not gonna work, I see. Yeah, you, you, I, th I thought you would have liked the tisane. Tell me. Square root, one root. Yeah, that I really don't like. <laughs> no, th these square roots are a major pain in the neck. No. 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 Hey, check this out. This guy. There we go. Huh? What? Oh, it's Zan. Uh, it's a it's a mental it's a it's, it's a herbal tea. It's a herbal tea. So you you will walk in Ipanema Beach with a chamomile. Warm chamomile, and you'll be the coolest on the block. <laughs> Just don't say that I gave it to you. Okay, D D X of sine theta equal zero. Okay, and then uh, since we are at it, and I believe that yes, so. Did I make some, D operates on this guy. Okay, so you can say, well, it seems sounds like just reshuffling, what why is good? Well, what you can say is, why, not, why don't we define actually a, another field now, which is U of X, R, sine, And I believe that the uh, cheat sheet is no longer necessary. So we can get rid of it and use the space to proceed. According to my calculation, this lecture will start after four of this board. Okay? So what do we do now? This you substitute in here. All right? What do you have to do? Well, okay, the two will go here and stay there. This guy's become u bar divided by r squared, u divided by r squared. This guy will become u, and another factor of r will appear there. Okay? My pedagogical batteries are exhausting, so I'm tempted to just say, Should we just, okay, I'll be, I'll prove that I can persist. U bar minus U of X 
square square plus a r no this is no longer there there you go but a two is there du dx okay. if you want if you want squared yeah that one we got also because it, it better be because this is dimensionless and this is this is length okay and why not flipping This doesn't look too bad, actually. Huh? And my friend, I told you that this was nonlinear. We are deriving a nonlinear <laughs> field theory, so <laughs> you have to expect it. And that, that, but you know why it's nonlinear? It, it's not that we are bad. It's just that it, it, you see what has happened in this system. In this system, you know, the, the guys who like linear stuff. They always say something like omega squared equal. Right, it's a long time since they've done, done this. But in this system, since they're spinning, there's also something like that. You, know, you guys know what I'm doing. This is energy. Okay? So this is say k, k, right? And so this this thing here like that okay and there is something here you know how the pro called this huh gap. gap gap the gap so gap means if you look at low frequency that is to say very low energies you're not gonna find this type of solution Okay, which is a plane wave of solution. Now, what we've done here maliciously by making these things rigid is to take the gap and push it all the way to infinity. Okay, why? Because this is a, it's a frequency scale that would come from the square root of the spring constant. The moment in which we make it infinitely rigid, that frequency shoots up. And why? Because something infinitely rigid is not going to be the time of oscillation. You know, you're going with the, the edge of it's it's it, sorry, omega goes to infinity. T is, is very short because it is very rigid. It will do like that. Okay. So in this system, the gap it's the only thing you have. Okay. And now you try to propagate something in the gap. And the only channel available is nonlinear objects. That's why I was saying this is a topological insulator when you confine yourself to linear response or to linear approximation modes, but it becomes a conduct in the nonlinear field. Okay, but now we have one step more to do, which is to solve that equation. Now, I thought that uh, concluding with a little exercise would not be bad. Also, size, solve it. Also, because once you have the solution, you can plug it in and convince that it's good. Okay, so the solution to that equation, which uh, um, is really something that uh, um, is worth keeping in mind, because it shows up in a lot of uh, um, in a lot of context, is this: that there's a width. Okay, the width is given by. I'm going to write it in color because it's kind of an interesting result. It's given by a squared over two u bar. Okay. Now, there's one thing that I want to. Two things that I want to say. Notice this is a static domain wall. It's literally. 
the angles that you would be measuring if you did this very, very carefully. And x naught is where I centered it. If I'm moving this by hand at a velocity v, x naught will shift and will become minus vt. It would be more complicated if you had springs. Okay? So it, it's worth emphasizing. Here, what we've taken is the limit in which this spring constant, Ke, has gone to infinity. So linkages. Okay? Then this is the solution. There's not much more to it, but there's already something that we can do. We can plot it. Okay? So actually, first of all, have you guys seen things like that in your life? Say again? No? I, th I suspect that many of you have seen it. Maybe not quite the formula. But the word domain wall in magnetism means something to you. I bet, you know, I teach this class, so you must have taken two. Second order phase transition, right? You can have magnetization that goes from being up to down over domain wall. That's exactly that. So what this is saying is the domain wall that interpolates between two different allowed value of the uniform ground state, which is what you were asking, if you like, u bar and minus u bar. Notice the form of this. As a width. And this width, aside from the riding factor of a squared, is proportional to 1 over r sine theta bar. No, exactly. If you, if you did stretch, then you, just, you don't write a constraint equation, but you write down a field theory. And then it's more complicated. Why? Because you can trade off some compression for the kinetic energy, and hence the solution, in fact, it's kind of cute, will be a Lorentz invariant theory. So as this thing moves at higher velocity, it contracts its width. Okay? Of course, we can do that too. But notice what I want to draw your attention to. There's something that happens when theta bar is equal to zero. Think about magnetism. You see, I always uh, assign this problem. You know, you, in magnetism, you measure correlation function, two-point correlation function. Then from a correlation function, you can extract the correlation length. The correlation length at the critical point diverges, okay? But you can also see that divergence differently. In a non-uniform system where you have a domain wall, the width of the domain wall is that correlation length. Partly because at the critical point, there's only one length that does all the game. Okay? And so if you look at the size of domain walls as you approach the critical point, you will see that diversion. So here, the divergence of the width indicates that at that point, something special is happening. At that point, the system is no longer gapped. Okay? So I've restored that uh, translational symmetry that it's uh, uh, not only presumption, but I restored the long wavelength phonons that are there from Goldstone Moore. So that is the only thing you cannot do if you want to preserve the stability, the robustness topologically of this object. No. Actually, this is, it's not, this is not a, a thermal theory, but if you wrote actually the elastic energy, uh, the, the term that is proportional to the quadratic, the factor in, fer in, in front of the quadratic bar is theta bar. So theta bar plays the role of T minus TC, and this theory actually reduces to landau Ginzburg theory. Okay? But I think the first thing I want to say is that let's digest that, see a little bit how, how much time I've used, and reassess whether you want to know more detail or not, or discuss what we've done here, okay? There's only one other aspect that I want to tell you. Notice that 
um, this equation doesn't behave very well <laughs> when you go from du dx positive to du dx negative. In other words, if you have this solution, which is a positive gradient, and you want to put in something that has a negative mm -hmm. gradient, it's not automatic a solution of that. Okay? That's very important. And so, uh, in this business, imagine when you have a normal easing model. Um, can I erase some of these things? Maybe this part here? This one is probably a good idea to kill. When you have an easing model, imagine that you, 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 you study the easing model. Okay? And these are different magnetization domains. Okay? And let's say that you study it on a, on a ring. What you would say is that you have a kink here and an anti-kink there. And if the conditions are periodic, which is what happens in the ring, you better make sure that this object is exactly canceled by that one. You could have 300 of this guy and, and minus 300 of that guy. That would be fine because it will raise the energy. But you've got to have them matching in numbers. By contrast, for example, if you demand that you have something like this, with a minus infinity and plus infinity, the two ends do not need to, 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 to meet, then you have a net amount of kinks, which is plus one. Okay? And so what I want to write down is um, what I could call, somewhat pretentiously, a topological conservation law that embeds this property that we just discussed. That, you know, this is not, this, it's not the symmetry that comes from the Noether theorem that gives you this conservation law. This is just the behavior of the boundary, something simpler, if you like. It's, or, or I don't know if it's simpler, it depends on how complicated the problem is, but it's, it's geometry's topology. Another example would be, if I take a bar, this is similar to what he was doing, and you take a bar, a line, then I twist it and re-glue it, there's somebody stuck, something stuck there, which is a kink in twist. And if I've done it twice, I will have two of them, all right? Okay, so here, let's see what happens. Already, those of you who have played with this have noticed that once you start moving the kink inside here, nothing else moves. So this is the perfect channel. It allows only one guy to move unperturbed, stable, but I cannot do the usual game of sending, say, kink and anti-kink, see whether they pass each other, okay? So let's see how does that work. Well, first of all, if I want to embed this into equation, since they, the kink and the anti-kink differ because in, in one case, du dx is negative in this region, there is positive, what I can just write down is a quantity, which is, equal 1 over 2 theta bar integral from minus infinity to plus infinity or, or throughout the sample, let's put it that way, dx of d, du dx, this is a little bit trivial, u infinity minus u minus infinity. Okay? Well, divided by that part. That part comes So, if you are on a ring, u infinity and u minus infinity are identified. Okay? So, q must be equal to zero. Okay? By contrast, if you have the situation that we have here, that on one hand you are left lean, u bar, and on the other hand you are right lean, minus u bar, then you are in this case. And then you do u bar minus minus u bar, that's two u bar, divided by two u bar, gives you a net charge of one. Okay? 
Now, in a normal system, that would just tell you that the net number of kinks must be one, but you could have three kinks minus two anti-kinks, okay? But notice, this construction here does not have this, in which a du dx going into minus du dx is a symmetry of rock. That means that in what pretentiously you could call the zero energy sector of this theory, um, you can only have either kink or anti-kinks, but not both. That's not a property of the model. It's only a property of the fact that you work at zero energy. And that's where we got that equation from. So the anti-kinks are suppressed. So the fact that Q equal one is uh, the conserved quantity also means that there is w one and only one kink present in the system at the time and nothing else. And it will move undisturbed, will not care what other people do. And this is the story essentially of what you see here and the reason for the robustness of this mechanical device. Thank you very much for attending. Well, my guess is that if you, um, okay, the way I would do is that uh, I would say, since it's easing-like behavior, um, first of all, you, you realize that in order to write down the field theory, uh, the question that you, you, you would be asking is, what is the Lagrangian of the Hamiltonian of the system in uh, the absence of, um, sorry, when the spring constant is not infinite, because otherwise you just have constraints, okay? Then you would say, well, you need an energy that favors uh, one of these two states, which is, so this is energy versus U, this is U bar minus U bar, and you know how to write down such an energy, okay? It will have, um, a u squared plus b u to the fourth, okay? And by tuning this, you will be in good shape. Then you will say, well, look, I also don't want this u to change. Okay, so notice that this is a functional, right? So, okay? Then you, you will add du dx squared, for example. But I think if you um, are used to physics, where typically um, the solution of your theories uh, come from writing down a functional and uh, taking a function, energy, not free energy, energy, and taking a functional derivative, that operation means please find an extremum, minimize. Here, what we're doing is we're saying, well, that, that's okay, but on top of that, we want actually something stronger. We don't want it just to be a minimum. We want E equal zero. So you're setting the energy equal to something, not just the derivative equal to something. That means that our equation of motion will have things that look like boundary terms that you would not normally pick up naively. So since you're so curious, why don't I show you? Um, do, do I have a few extra minutes? Uh, it, you, you guys can bear a couple of uh, slides? Yeah. Okay, well, I, given the enthusiastic response from Zwami, <laughs> who is rarely, is rarely a, a, a fan of field theory, I, I really feel uh, uh, entitled to do everything to you. I have to say, my own preference is after going to the beach. So I'll. Uh, you know, I was gonna stick it to 10 minutes max. Um, can I have the, the thing to? I just want to show you such a, such a thing. And also, the, actually, the thing that I really want to show you even more than the, the uh, more equations, I wanna show you that it works. Because 
<laughs> this stuff is really always a bit fun. And then I want to show you something else. So, you know, usually when you write an equation, the, the most fun part of it is what doesn't work. Okay, because that's usually what you couldn't guess at the beginning when you try to write those equations. You know, this is, of course, a bit of a perverse way of thinking, but I, I think it's really the only one one can have. So that may seem a little bit messy, but it really isn't. Um, uh, why do I say that? Uh, uh, William, can I get this, the pointer? So first of all, notice that I've also written down, ah, you didn't bring it, um, okay. Um, well, uh, too bad, um, I'm a bit on the short side, but, okay. Well, anyway, uh, first of all, this is a Lagrangian. So Lagrangian is T minus V, where T is the kinetic energy. So that is the kinetic term. Oh, first of all, the, the, the thing, the equation on the very top that's the discrete one. So those are the rotor. They're the moment of inertia. Okay? So this is the kinetic term. And then these three pieces are exactly what we were discussing. The middle piece here is exactly that polynomial function, which has a u fourth term and a u squared term. Okay? This one here is du dx that penalizes gradient. And then there is this one here. This boundary term is the more funny one. Okay? Notice you can take those three terms, package them together, and you know what that is. It's, ah, can you raise this a bit? Sorry, I know that this is a bit bad. So yeah, uh, just a minute. I was just thinking what, what I'm gonna say. Um, you see? This, you know, forgive the factor, of, I don't know, I cannot guarantee the factor of A and two, but you square this, you get you get that, you, 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 you square the last term, you get this. You, square, you square this one, you get the middle. And then the cross product is the third term. The pro called this BPS trick. Trick used a lot in uh, field theory sometimes. Mark probably has written paper on this stuff. Now, what that tells you is that that energy, the part that concerns, not the kinetic part, but the deformation can be made to vanish as long as this equation is satisfied. Okay? But going back to you, if I had to guess this one, I would have probably guessed everything except for the last term being a little bit touchy. And also notice that this last term is what the easing model doesn't have. Because in the easing, well, actually the easing model has two differences with respect to this. I keep going back to the magnetization because I think it's really the, the place where you study a field in condensed matter for the first time. So in the, uh, in the magnetization problem, there are two features. A domain wall cost energy. Here it doesn't cost energy. Why? Because of this term. Because once I put this term together with the other two, I can make a perfect square, and if the content of that square vanishes, the potential energy is zero. Why in this system the um, anti, the, the, not the, the, the anti-kink cannot cost the same amount of energy than the kink? Again, because I have this guy, the du dx. If the du dx is there, then it breaks explicitly the symmetry in the ground state between the kink and anti-kink, and hence, I have this peculiar behavior of the topological charge that I was indicating. And of course, what you can do is you can say, well, if you have this machinery, you probably can write down solutions. Can you please lower this? 
Uh, one thing that uh, it didn't, uh, uh, can, can you think you can lower it a bit? What's the connection? Can, can, can you can you please lower? <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, but I want to. I want to. I, I really want to show you the this thing. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's great. Now, uh, notice one thing here. So there there are different ways of doing this. One is formal, and you say you have a Lagrangian. You see what symmetry that Lagrangian has. That Lagrangian has to have a symmetry which is Lorentz invariant. Now this mystifies stuff because it has nothing to do with bloody relativity. It's just because that's a combination of some changes that you do. Well, it has to do with relativity because relativity is like that too. But the way I would say it is this. You look at this and it says one thing. In the linkage limit, the speed of light goes to infinity because that's not the speed of light, it's the speed of sound. So in the linkage limit, this guy is not there. You don't worry about it. The width of the soliton or the kink is purely dictated by geometry. Now, if you go in the springs system, then you can do one thing, which is to trade off some of the potential energy for kinetic energy. And so the solution that you found in the, in the, in the linkage limit is no longer the right one, because by changing it a little bit, you can make the potential energy a bit unhappy and the kinetic energy a bit happier. And there's a trade-off. And that trade-off results effectively in a Lorentz contraction of the width of the soliton, or the kink, as it moves faster and faster. Notice that this is another feature of nonlinear objects. The, the velocity at which they propagate, as well as their features, depend on how hard you kick, unlike linear waves. And then you can say, well, okay, if all this stuff is correct, why don't you go in a simulation? You could have done it in an experiment too, if you just track it. Plot as the dots the position of the particle, that's u, the rotors, the r sine theta, versus x minus x naught. And, and you, as a red light, the line, you plot this equation. And of course, you can see they, they match pretty well. And of course, if you say, well, I want to see more, I want to see the Lorentz contraction, well, you say, well, I'm going to do it faster. Forget this because it's a bit technical. Forget this is a bit technical. Um, this is what I want to show. As I increase the speed, the, um, the width contracts. There's also other interesting phenomena. There's a wake. Because if you noticed, you see, this is, this is the beauty of, uh, of elasticity compared to, to other stuff. Notice this kinetic term. That kinetic term, purely for geometrical reasons, is not linear. It can be linearized, which, is, which you can do a small solid and velocity, but it's non-linear. So it means that there is going to be transfer. Uh, it, it's something like, this is an analogy. You know when you have a disk that moves in a fluid, and if it moves very fast, there's stuff happening behind that escapes the description, the continuum description, turbulence, essentially. Now, I just want to say one final thing. Look at this. It's the same system that we started so far, but just a different choice of parameter. We call this thing, forget flying Gordon theory, we call this spinner. The one before was more like a flipper, it resembled the, the American pop toy, Jacob's Ladder. This is a different beast. Notice it rotates a full circle as it moves. You could say, well, look, how come you, know, you, you spend like two hours doing all this blah, blah, blah? You miss this guy, right? Well, there's a hint. If you plot, okay, first notice that's the projection. Notice that the projection at that alternate sites, the theta n and the theta n plus one, do things that seem quite difficult, different. Like the theta n and the theta n plus two, they look similar. But the theta n and theta n plus one, no. It's as if you had two identical copies of some stuff stuck together. I think if you look at it, it's better than me saying a lot of words because it's really it. But then you say, okay, I don't really see it. 
Can you please plot theta x for me as you, as you did it before? And then you find these two curves, okay? These thick two curves for n and n plus one, the distinct branches, if you like, okay? And of course, what you can do is you can write down the theories for it, and we did it. But the fact that you can write down theories is not the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing for us was, look, we see this stuff, it looks very interesting, it's different qualitatively. It also delivers the point that while the topological protection mechanism is a global property of the system, by just changing the geometry of the unit cell, I can get different type of the solutions. That's why we're saying that this is the simplest topological mechanical metamaterial. Okay? But most crucially, I look at it and I say, boy, this is pointless. Because this occurs when you make those sticks long, and there's a lot of self-interception. Yeah, I mean, you know, you want to do mechanical engineering, this is not the way to go. But I want to emphasize it, or even just build the model, and then leave it alone the engineering, because then you would have to do even something useful. But in this case, can, can it even exist? Can you even embed that structure in the world we live in? Louder. And then? So if you wanted to test your hypothesis, good. That, I mean, essentially we did everything you did, exactly it took me two weeks. And I had to be convinced that it was worth doing. The answer is yes, it's precisely what you're saying. Absolutely. And I'm gonna show it to you, and I'm gonna show it to you, really give it to you. In fact, it's here. But I think it's probably worth elaborating a little bit on your suggestion because it's not sim so simple. I think what he's saying is that, yes, they're hitting each other. But if before they hit each other, somehow you can extend the system in the transverse direction in such a way that it moves to the next. Then when the next is about to hit, it moves again. All the self-interception can be avoided. But effectively what you're doing is you are Un unfolding or you're expanding what looks like a 1D structure there into a full-blown two-dimensional system. So um, <clears throat> you can get this movie from the archive too. Can the spinner be realized? This is the concise answer of Brian Chen who figured it out. You stagger in the third dimension, in the, in the, in the transverse direction. In a sense, in a sense, but he has this property of the that you know will work irrespective of how you 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 if you deform it a little bit, it will not stop. That topological protection that I was talking about. But you can see here. I mean, I'm going to encourage you to come and play around if you want. Okay, here is just some pictures to illustrate. So let me just say that you can rationalize the zoo of different type of solitons purely by looking at the geometry of the unit cell, okay? But this is now switching more in talk mode. So uh, I'm just, you know, gonna summarize by saying there are ways of characterizing the difference between this and the spinner, and there's a, a boundary that you can draw in a, in a phase space in terms of the parameter of this mechanical structure that tells somebody who wants to build it where you have one and where you have the other. And this part doesn't depend on the global consideration about the structure, but just on how you make the unit cell. Okay? Well, again, I think that will uh, conclude the presentation.
And here you can find the paper if you're interested, and moreover, most crucially, all the movies, which are even more informative. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, no, the metamaterial is a bit more broad. It's I read the slide. Metamaterial essentially is usually a, a structure, even mechanical or even uh, non. For example, you have in, in mind the pendry, for example, meta metamaterial in optics. A metamaterial is a structure, especially in mechanics, that owes peculiar property to the geometry of the unit itself. Okay? And so in this case, the geometry of the unit itself is the geometry of that four bar link. Okay, here is an origami. Okay. And so typically they have peculiar properties of conductive sound, which is what we're doing here essentially. Be or in two dimension, they can be shielding or, or cloaking, which is what. In mechanics, one of the things that people usually are interested in is to engineer a certain elastic moduli given a, a, a given geometry of the unit itself, a sort of an inverse product. Okay. It would be like in optics, you want maybe an, the electric response as a function of uh, some structure. Last, I'm gone. After okay. this, I'm gone. Okay. Or, or rather, I would say that you have a perfect square. Yeah, no, I, I'm not referring to the uh, Lagrangian, oh. rather to the uh, to the Euler yeah. uh, 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 equation. So you don't have a second derivative, so, so you can only go up or down, basically, <coughs> okay, to interpolate between the plus and the minus state. Yeah. Okay, so the, the two cannot cancel. If you have a second yeah. derivative, then you would, yeah, absolutely, right, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. So. Uh, this translates into having a uh, sine of t times plus one minus t times in the discrete model. Yes. Okay. So you can do the reverse, yes. one more step in the reverse engineering yes. direction and say, okay, now let's say that I want to have, uh, to make sure that I don't. Uh, uh, it's a good question. Can you do that? Then? Uh, yes, and, and it's a good question. I don't still, I don't yet have a good answer. I have a good candidate of an answer, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it. But the way I would ask that question is: Is there a symmetry mm -hmm. that exactly. a vast class at of the system at the, cell at level. the level of the original cell, cell or, or system even mm -hmm. uh, that ensures this property? Okay. And I think so. Okay. And so, very quick one: If you add the elasticity. How do the how do the linear waves uh, scatter? Actually, in a sense, what you saw on, on the wave, silicon, yeah, but it's the. But that's also an. Uh, um you see, imagine when you excite a high energy soliton. Uh -huh. In the in the system with spring, the gap is there, but it's not to infinity. Yeah. So you excite a high energy soliton. Part of its energy can disperse in terms right. of the high frequency right. phonons, right. and that's the wake behind. And that's why it gets larger when you go faster. But if you prepare, but if you did it with linkages, it would not happen okay. because with linkages you cannot have vibrations at all. 